Amelia, what uh, what, what what number I, am I in the sequence? Um, let's see. We go Rashid, Nayantara, Claudie, you, Roberto, and then Masoon. Thank you. Yes. So second to the last. Got it. What uh. What, what, what number I, am I in the sequence? Um, let's see, we go Rashid, Nayantara, Claudie, you, Roberto. Are we ready to start, Karen? Yes, we are. Okay. Well, welcome everyone who is joining us today. Um, it's an incredible group. It looks like we almost have 100 people. And I can already see people I recognize. So this is going to be a great conversation. Um, on behalf of the Arts and Democracy Project and Naturally Occurring Cultural Districts, New York, I want to welcome you to tonight's conversation. In a moment, you're gonna see longer descriptions about both of these projects. You likely know them already, but we wanna make sure you get some more information. Um, in just a moment, we're gonna do a land acknowledgement, but before we get to that, I just wanna make sure we cover a couple housekeeping pieces. Um, one, just a reminder that we're recording, as you can see, um, we're recording this event to share with those who are unable to make it tonight. If you would prefer to not be seen or have, you, have your image captured, uh, we invite you to turn off your video for the next hour or so. Also, um, closed captioning is available. And to activate this option, you just click on the CC, the closed caption button in the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the window. And then you'll click live transcription. All right. So whether we gather uh, virtually or in person, we acknowledge that we are settlers on the homelands of the many who have come before us. We are beneficiaries of the white colonial state and the violent and violently that violently forced the displacement, relocation, and erasure of indigenous peoples. That was historically and it continues today. With this acknowledgement, we commit to dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism while also naming that as beneficiaries, we have a responsibility to support the movements of indigenous peoples and their continued fight for self-determination. Thank you so much again for joining us. I'm incredibly excited to be with you tonight. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Amalia and I'm on the board of Arts and Democracy and I get to be your MC slash facilitator um, for this evening's conversation. You know, a note before we even get into the program, you know, we were really blessed with an abundance of experience. Um, you can see with all the people turning out tonight and probably equal recognition of many of the names that dozens of people could have been speakers tonight. There's just so much talent in the room and such a wealth of expertise and experience with us. And so we wanna invite you into this space tonight um, embracing the concepts of what it means to be both a teacher and a learner. And by that we mean, we hope over the course of the next hour and a half, you really find a place where you can share something unique with your colleagues and comrades on the call, um, but you can also equally find something that you can learn. And we encourage everyone to step into that dual, duality and balance. We're gonna do our very best with such a large number of people to make tonight's conversation dynamic and provide different opportunities for multiple voices to be with us. Some of that will be in small group conversations. Others will be in, um, other opportunities will emerge through breakout groups, question and answer, discussion, um, and using the chat. We encourage you to embrace all of the tools that are available, however imperfect they may be. They may be. But now to just sort of give a sense of everyone who's with us tonight, and the breadth of voices um, and experiences in the room, in the room, um, we're gonna ask people to introduce themselves uh, by region. We know the regions are a little bit imperfect, but you'll see in the chat that these are the ones I'm gonna call out. 
when I call out your region, if you would share your name, your pronouns, your affiliation. Um, and we also have a link if you wanna share the native lands that you're on, if you don't know those names already. So let's start in the Southeast and see in the chat who is with us tonight from the Southeast. All right, how about Midwest? Oh, Judy Jennings. Oh, great, here they come. We'll keep the Southeast coming. Who's with us from the Midwest? Hello and welcome. Let's keep going um, and try the West Coast. And now to the Southwest. And finally, the Northeast. Excellent. And I already see questions about what about. We know the regions are a little clumsy, so please just feel free to introduce yourself if you don't feel like you fit into any of the ones we used. All right, so tonight we're gonna to be talking a lot about narrative and change, which of course we know story plays such an important part. And so to just get us warmed up and kind of separate ourselves from our work day so we can share time here together, we're gonna to do just a quick participatory activity in chat. In a moment, I'm gonna invite you each to help us create a one word story. Um, very simply, I'm gonna read out a prompt and ask you to type one word into the chat but don't hit send, don't hit return. Just let the word linger in the chat. Um, and then I will count backwards from five, five, four, three, two, one. And when I say send, we'll all send them together and just get a sense of kind of who's here and how we define the same, um, how we can define and redefine the prompts. So the prompt tonight is really an invitation to, to redefine what power looks like and feels like um, for those of us who are gathered here tonight. And the prompt is, when I am my most powerful self, I am. And finish that prompt with one word. When I am my most powerful self, I am. You can enter it into the chat. Don't hit send yet. I'm gonna start counting backwards from five. So five, four, three, two, one, send. Excellent. Take a minute to just look and see what people shared, you know, and begin this process that we're going to be in tonight where we're where we're sharing and we're harvesting what we can learn from one another. I invite you all to take a second to scroll through the chat, just being mindful of all of the different ways that we can define and redefine power when we're working together. Okay, and now to our program. I'm super excited to be joined by five fantastic speakers tonight. Again, there's so many people on this call who could have been with us and we're hopeful that you'll share in the breakouts um, and other opportunities tonight because we all wanna learn from one another. Uh, our first speaker for the night will be Rashid Shabazz, who's currently the executive director of Critical Minded. After that, we'll have Nayantara Sen, who's the director of programs and cultural strategies for Real, real Food, Real Stories and the Senior Fellow at Pop Culture Collaborative. Third will be Claudia Mabry, um, Program Consultant from Naturally Occurring Cultural Districts, New York. She'll be joined in spirit by Ms. Gwendolyn Wilson, the Director of Senior Services at the Jacob Rees Neighborhood Settlement. Fourth for this evening will be Roberto Bedoya, Cultural Affairs Manager for the City of Oakland. And then finally, we'll have Masoom Moitra, Director of Greenlight District, El Puente. I'm giving you their names now so you sort of know the flow of the conversation. 
Um, and I'll be asking each one to introduce themselves within the context of their work. So first, Rashid, I want to turn to you. I mean, culture has been, our culture and story have really been part of your work since the very beginning, whether a culture, um, uh, sorry, um, at all the different organizations you worked at, Color of Change, and now with your new project. Talk to us a little bit about narrative power, racial justice, and, and what shifting culture and narrative means to you. Thank you, Amalia, for, for the introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be in community with, with all of you. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction and invitation as well um, to be part of this. Um, as, as mentioned, my name is Rashid Shabazz. I sit on Lenape land, native land. I am um, he, his. And I, as mentioned, I am the new executive director of an initiative called Critical Minded. I wanna just briefly use my time just, just to talk through some ideas that have been emerging. My, my ideas are always constantly evolving, evolving. And I think that a large part of that is that culture itself is constantly evolving. Um, there are things that are always um, consistent as we think about values and systems, but we also know that culture is, is ever you know, contested and always evolving both in, in ways that we can control in ways that we can't. Narratives help us to make meaning of the world, as we know. They help us to process and translate and transmit values. And we do this through story. And, and stories that we think about can be in the media, in film, in books, in newspapers, and all communicate the ideas. Um, and I, I say contested ideas of society, community, and what it means to be a nation. The story of the past five years, for example, one may describe as a resurgence in organizing by white supremacists, a rise in hate crimes, a resurgence of populism that is anti-immigrant, anti-Black, anti-Asian, anti-Semitic, one that is anti-LGBTQ, and a story that is less compassionate and less humane as we think about the stories of migrants' children at the border. It would also be a story of hard fought victories gained, like the story of, our, of Fair Fight and Stacey Abrams and Black women and progressives advancing voter rights in Georgia that is now, as we see, being contested again. But Black women, as we've said, saved our democracy once again. But one of the lessons I've learned um, to the point about, I've been doing this over two decades, um, one that I've, I've always come back to is this idea that I've always tried to share is that the idea of narrative has to always be rooted in historical reference. The story of the past five years, not simply the resurgence of rise in white supremacy or resurgence of hate crimes or however we're defining it, but rather it never ceased to exist, but rather it's part of a historical continuum. And if we continue to think about narratives as something new or emergence, we're not ever gonna really get to the point of how we articulate it within a larger continuum of historical reference points. And I also think about it from a reference point of violence. So I always start with, in order to get to narrative power, to narrative infrastructure, as my dear friend and the president of color change um, describes it, we must first have a historical reference point to know where we have come and where we are going. I always reference in my work, Marlon Riggs and the work of ethnic notions. And I, while I am still watching and processing, I just even right now, I think about the work of Raul Beck's Exterminate All the Brutes, uh, while challenging at times to process the level of violence that it explains it too gives us historical markers for the narratives that have led to the violence and attacks that we continue to witness today due to the history and legacy and present reality of white supremacy, which is also a grounding of how I do work and how I move work forward. Thinking about the ways that white supremacy impacts us every day, how does the narratives of the past five years help us to process the trial of George Floyd, the attacks on Asian Americans, the killing of Dante Wright last night by another Minneapolis police officer? These things we cannot ignore. So Rashad Robinson, as I mentioned, he argues in his piece, Changing Our Narrative, about narrative, which I believe has been shared in the documents um, that are within the collective resource, argues that in order to shift the narrative, conversation, we need to build narrative power, which means simply taking, talking about change, not simply talking about change, but leveraging our power to change the rules and norms that shape our society and behaviors. It is, he says, moving simply 
beyond being present, but being powerful. But to leverage the idea of power, we know power requires resources and people. Resources we can define by all things from money to people to ideas or simply infrastructure. This means by which we can begin to consistently drive our ideas and approaching as Rashad describes a narrative infrastructure, a way in which we can start to immerse people and disperse, pe disperse our cultural impact in a consistent way that we scale over time. It also means that we engage everyday people, people who are the ones who can move forward in the ways in which we think about this work. But in the work that I've done, I also thought about narrative, building narrative power from the perspective of understanding how we shift culture and how we change um, and build cultural power. And that for me means that we also have to think about authenticity. We have to be true to who we are, even if that truth may not be the truth others tell us. And so I'm not speaking only by truth making because truth making is an act in of itself. We've seen with the last president that truth can be ignored and formed in however we see it. Um, but it also means that we have to think about accountability matters, the audience matters, who we're speaking to, how we're speaking to people, how we're thinking about people. These all things build into how we think about narrative power and how we build power. We Artists have one minute remaining. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Artists and entertainers are at the forefront, I would argue, um, at this moment of an urgent conversation about racial justice in this country. And they are demanding I would say we need to demand a more diverse pool of with the work that I'm now leading critics to respond to this work of art and the culture in which we're in. As the executive director of Critical Minded, these are things that I'm starting to, to think about. How do we control the debate and public discourse about culture, dictate the politics and ideas that shape the values and policies that impact our lives? These things are essential parts of narrative power. And then we intersect that with the ideas of racial justice, the middle of a pandemic, the protest of the last year, and then now we merge that with health equity. All these things help us to understand not only the importance of seeing these things from a holistic perspective, but also a historical one as well, and then understanding the role of not only critics, but artists and cultural makers in trying to make meaning of the world in which we're in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashid. We're gonna turn next now to um, Nayantara, but you'll notice Rashid in the chat, there were already some questions from folks about some of the resources you mentioned. And so maybe you could drop those in as well. Um, Nayantara, obviously you are no, um, you're not new to this either, being a storyteller, someone who's steeped in media production, art and culture um, and cultural strategies. You know, talk to us a little bit about your work, but also the way that you're thinking about culture and culture shift when it comes to the intersection of cultural strategy. Amalia, thank you. And Rashid, thanks um, for all you shared as well. Um, I will chime right in. But first, before I start, I actually want to um, give gratitude and thanks to many, many folks who are on the line. Um, several of you I'm noticing not just familiar names, but folks who I have had the benefit and the privilege of learning from in the past. And so actually just want to share before I go into a little bit about story narrative and culture, um, at this point in my life, I can identify as a woman of color who works professionally as a narrative and cultural strategist. And it's a really interesting thing to be able to say how I got here. Um, it's a bit of a convoluted journey. There wasn't really a clear path. I really was an arts administrator and somehow was now recovering from being an arts administrator and have found myself in narrative and cultural strategy work, particularly on racial equity and gender equity issues. But um, I do actually want to give some overdue credit to um, NOCDNY and arts and democracy specifically for the cultural organizing workshops and spaces that you all have hosted over the years. Um, a decade ago, I was in New York and I was attending. And so for those of you that have the chance to now attend in over Zoom virtually, please do. There re these peer learning exchanges and those workshops in particular have been just really instrumental for especially for folks like us who are women of color wanting to actually make meaningful contributions in the cultural strategy space, it's good to be in relationship and it's good to learn together. So thank you for that. Um, and I'm so grateful to see so many folks that um, I have 
learned from over the years. So I wanted to actually make a couple of um, contributions here to the conversation. We're spending the bulk of the time today talking about narrative power and cultural strategies. And I will say that um, in the last several years, I have moved away from language about narrative shift or culture shift to talking more specifically about building cultural power and building narrative power. So I don't in my own practice use the language of narrative shift anymore, uh, partially because narratives are constantly in flux and they're constantly in opposition and they're doing battle in the, in the landscape for culture. So um, narrative shift in a way or culture change in a way is more of a descriptor of what is already happening as opposed to a uh, goal for what we are trying to achieve, which is strategy that gets us to increase power for both narrative and culture, to actually be able to contest for power in the narrative realm and the cultural realm. Um, so Amalia, to the question that you posed in terms of how I think about culture change work in relationship to story and narrative and cultural strategies, um, I actually want to share, many of you will have heard this before, but I find it to be an incredibly useful metaphor or analogy. It comes from a couple of places, primarily from the Center for Story-Based Strategy, also from the Narrative Initiative. Um, and it is the simple metaphor of the relationship between story, narrative, and culture in, um, in the format of a star and a constellation and a galaxy. So the linkage here is like a star, um, a story is a bright, um, singular, um, and shiny, um, excuse me, someone's clearly at the door. Um, it, a star grabs our attention because it is identifiable and it helps us with navigation. And constellation is important in relationship to the star because it is a meaning making and pattern um, making mechanism. So when you look at the star, you know where you are because you notice its position in a constellation. So a narrative is a constellation because stories taken together, they aggregate into narratives. And then by um, extrapolation, uh, culture is like the galaxy, which is far bigger than narratives and um, encompasses actually the galaxy. In fact, our particular home, the Milky Way, is um, not just a galaxy made up of constellations, but for those of you that follow NASA's um, uh, weekly or monthly news reports, the galaxy is actually expanding at an absurd rate. Our Milky Way is growing so fast, we don't even know much of what's in it, including black holes and meteors and planets and more. So the, the realm of culture in this particular analogy is, is important to think about because culture is epistemic. In other words, it is the mechanism that allows us to know why and what and how we are. It is the, the home for how we actually navigate in the world and certainly it defines reality. So um, to the point about strategy, you know, a lot of times we talk about narrative strategy or cultural strategy. The truth is at the level of intervention, the kind of change we want to see, we actually have to have a trifold strategy that is for building power in three realms. We need story-based strategy, narrative strategy, and cultural strategy. Um, and so I, what I actually would love to do, and I deliberately didn't have slides because that's, you know, lots of Zoom meetings and lots of slides, but there is a link I dropped in the chat here. I wanted to share this concept of the Overton window. Um, and some of you might know it already. I don't often um, quote or reference Joseph Overton, um, but in this context, I wanted to because there's a particular usefulness to this framework when it comes to understanding the relationship between story narrative and, and culture. And here what the Overton window shows you is that there, the Overton window is essentially the frame or the window that determines what is politically and culturally and socially feasible. So you see how ideas go from unthinkable to radical to somewhat accessible, acceptable, sorry, then sensible, popular. And then eventually by the time they get to the realm of policy, the idea is is recognizable and familiar enough that you can actually implement it into policy or legislation. So- um, Entire, yeah. you have one minute left. Thanks so much, Emily. Mm -hmm. So the idea here of, of cultural strategy is that we engage all aspects of culture, all of its myriad forms and media and genres and fields included in everything that actually constitutes cultural production in order to shrink 
um, what is considered, or actually to expand what is considered possible and feasible for us in the context of the Overton window. The one example I would wanna share just from the news cycle recently, all this talk recently about Biden's infrastructure plan and the two, $3 trillion that will go into making massive infrastructure uh, possible in the country and how it's connected to a particular strategy for corporate tax hikes and for quote unquote taxing the elite or taxing millionaires. So to see that policy actually take root in 2021 and to the point that Rashid was making about historical legacy and context, that, that strategy today is not possible unless Occupy Wall Street happened in the early, um, in the mid 2000s, right? So post Occupy Wall Street, a social movement that popularized the idea of the 99% and the 1% and the income inequality and the wage gap, that's what allows us today to have policy that could potentially tax um, the rich. So um, I think I will um, leave it at that. I'll put a few more links in the chat and I know we'll keep um, talking as well, so thanks. Thank you so much. So, Claudie, we're going to turn to you now. And, um, you know, our last two speakers were incredible and provided such rich scaffolding for how we think about the terminology, the theory, the strategy, the history. And I know you are sort of doing double duty today, talking about the work that NOCD New York has been doing, um, but also kind of carrying the story of Miss Gwen, um, who isn't able to join us, but will be on a, a short clip. Could you explain to us um, how you're using the power of story in a place-based way in New York and what are the projects that have actually emerged from the process? Thanks so much, Amalia. Um, so as she, as she just introduced me, my name is Claudie Mabry. I am with NOCD NY. Uh, I've been with NOCD NY for the last seven years, actually, with many folks on this call thinking around uh, particularly uh, public housing communities. Uh, which is a constituency that's uh, immersed uh, in arts and culture um, and legacy there. And so I'm here to give you a, um, a glimpse into what kind of uh, what narrative change work through the method of story circles has been looking like in a particular community in New York City that we're working with. And so at NOCD, we have an opportunity uh, this year uh, to participate on a project called What Creates Health at Queensbridge? And this project allows us to work with community partners and uh, public housing residents in the Queensbridge houses, which uh, for folks not in New York City is a housing development in Long Island City, Queens, uh, was right in the catchment area of the Amazon debacle a year and a half ago, and uh, is actually the largest uh, public housing footprint uh, in North America. So uh, systematically speaking, um, there's a lot of layers and different uh, narratives that are um, brought up across this one particular development alone. And um, our process is to work with residents in collaboration to identify different cultural strategies that are really working to shift those narratives, specifically narratives around uh, safety and health and well-being and what it means to be a public housing resident today. And so this work has allowed us to uh, work in collaboration with the Department of Health. Uh, Steffi Kingslake's on this call. She is our partner with uh, the city. And together we're working with local partners including Jacob Reese Neighborhood Settlement House, which is the local cornerstone in this housing development, to use um, story circles as a tool for really allowing residents to bring up lived experiences and perspectives and learn from one another and what it means to have a strong quality of life in Queensbridge. And so um, the reason we've done story circles is in collaboration with uh, Gwendolyn Wilson, who is our partner at Jacob Reese and her resident team, uh, Story Circles really was kind of a pilot opportunity that has really flourished into what we are seeing as a program in this uh, community. Uh, we took our Story Circle methodology from June Bug Productions, which I would like to just give a shout out for. Um, and they have really presented us with an inspirational and robust six step process that allows us to um, build stories, share them and reflect upon them in uh, a story circle uh, process. And so with the residents in Queensbridge with Gwendolyn Wilson's support, as well as with Amalia, who has actually been facilitating these story circles with us as well. Um, 
they have really become a powerful tool for uh, folks to come together and build empathy and identify commonalities in the neighborhood and just kind of identify meanings of, of coexisting and, and identifying how their stories and narratives can really shift against a lot of systemic powers that are impacting public housing in New York. Um, and I can, you know, attest to the power of what this really looks like in real time, uh, which you'll get to see a glimpse of in a moment. And Amali and I actually facilitated one this past Thursday, which invited some youth voices to the conversation. And so it's really been an honor to see this work carry out. And so what I would like to share with you um, in a moment is um, a clip from a story circle we facilitated in September uh, with Jacob Reese residents around unity and belonging and what it means to be in community at Queensbridge. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily who will be my tech support. And I invite you to uh, listen to Gwen's story. But it was just so different back then because people looked out for you. You didn't, you respected people back in the day. You would not do something in front of somebody else's parent because you knew that they was going to tell your parent. And it's just the respect that you had for people back in the day. And it's, it's like, I just, I just so sad because that's not what's happening now. And, and I know it's because we're a little older, so we learn differently than what the kids are learning now. Mm -hmm. And it has to be some kind of way where we connect to them. Because I know a lot of them are probably hurting. I know a lot of them are probably scared and don't know what to do. And it's like, how can we connect to them to get them to understand that you need to be respectful. We need to work together in order to have a community. Because it's, it, I tell you, it just, it just brings back a, a lot of stuff. Yeah. And as I'm reading this stuff, I do feel sad, but as I sit here, I, I'm right by my window, so I look out the window and I see all these young people just hanging out, mm -hmm. really not doing anything, mm -hmm. and not knowing that there is so much in this world for you. And it's like when I was bringing up my children, I made sure every year we went outside of Queensbridge to see something different, to let them know that you, th this is not who you are or where you have to be. You can go outside. And so that was just a glimpse of uh, what a circle can look like uh, when we facilitate them and we've adapted them to the Zoom space quite successfully as well. And so I just wanna close um, and really, I really mean it uh, to a testament to Gwen who couldn't make it tonight as uh, she's with her residents as we speak. Um, but just how much it means to me to be in, in this space with, with this fabulous group of people and um, to see how actually the work from the story circles is also connecting to a lot of other um, community-based priority and, and kind of narrative shift initiatives in their community. Uh, so one example is uh, this story circle and what was shared then inspired uh, the designs for murals that will now be fabricated across the community this spring. And so uh, Gwen stepped aside with me after this circle to just um, say to me how much this really means to her, not only as someone who works at Jacob Rees in the community-based sector, but as a resident and kind of born and raised resident of Queensbridge herself. And what this really means to get people together and shine a good light uh, and bring people up through the stories they hear with their neighbors and have that be an intergenerational and cross-cultural one at that as well. And I think uh, lastly, my biggest takeaway from uh, narrative change work that's rooted in the community is understanding the longevity of what you're doing and understanding that this is a long-term commitment and a community-led one at that and really um, honing in on the most grassroots level and effort to carry this work um, and strategy uh, for it to distill uh, throughout the community. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Malia. Thank you, Claudie. Um, and always, always so good to hear Ms. Gwen's voice. It really was a powerful 
process and so healing for so many people in lots of different ways. Um, Roberta, we're going to turn to you now. Um, obviously, you, you've been in your position now at the city of Oakland for a little bit. It's not brand new. Uh, always excited to hear what you're sharing, but I know you're doing a lot of thinking and conceptualizing and, and work around um, kind of the intersection of, of cities, civic infrastructure and narratives, and we'd love to hear from you about that or anything else you'd like to share. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, fellow panelists. It's very exciting to hear uh, the trouble that you guys are making. I applaud you. Uh, I'm a bureaucrat. It's so weird to, in a way, to be inside government trying to move the dial. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I've been up to. Um, uh, well, let me tell you this story about government. Um, once I did a cultural plan called Belonging in Oakland, and it, it becomes sort of like the North Star in which I sort of work to manifest uh, belonging uh, and justice in a just city. I'm proud to be part of Oakland, who has this deep, radical history of striving for a better uh, civic life. Uh, so we did a whole lot of community meetings as part of the process of developing the plan and everybody complains about government, rightfully so. And, uh, and our, our bureaucracy and a colleague of mine was talking to me about government bureaucracy and he, I was talking about it and he corrected me. It's not bureaucracy, it's bureaucracy. It does not move. You hit it, it will become even firmer. You pull on it. So the strategy then becomes, where do you put the feed? It will move when it's time to eat. And whether it's, so that brings up this whole thing about taxes and how that nonsense works. But I share that story to talk about how, when you're working in community with cultural activists uh, who are really start to um, think about uh, how to deal with and work on creating a just city, their frustration when they, they enter in the terrain of government. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, a project that, that I've uh, seeded called uh, Our Cultural Strategies and Government Program. But at the essence of uh, the cultural plan were the taglines. Equity is a driving force, culture is a frame, and belonging is the goal. So when we look at equity as a driving force, we think about how do we acknowledge disparities? What do we do? I have a Department of Race and Equity in government that helps me sort of with kind of doing the analysis to figure out how as a funder, public funder, we address questions of equity. Culture is a frame. I, I want, we were deliberate about saying culture, not so much art. Being mindful of uh, the ways people live their lives and not sort of always think about the art object. And belonging is the goal. It's about social connections and engagement. Now, the funny thing about belonging is it is a wonderful sticky word um, but I always am very clear that when I talk about belonging, I'm not talking about the psychology of belonging. I'm talking about the sociology. What are government policies that create belonging and disbelonging? We all know zoning as a, a, a great example uh, and an easy example of how belonging is manifest in public policies that say you don't belong. So how do you, how do you, how do I do that? So I um, have done that through a variety of initiatives that the plan came out three years ago, a variety of initiatives that uh, I call my, you know, belonging in Oakland initiatives. One is Neighborhood Voice, which is really community-based uh, projects where an artist and an NGO come together to work on a project that is really dealing with a community concern. 
uh, our neighbor concern. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> Just City Initiative, which is a collaboration between myself and the Akhenati Foundation, which is in Oakland and the East Bay Community Foundation to really be deliberate about looking at and imagining what a just city could look like uh, for people of color. Um, government is really weird. In California, it's really weird. I cannot create a, an initiative that is earmarked specifically for uh, BIPOC folks because uh, it's against the law. But I could, so I ended up in um, work creating this partnership with the East Bay Community Foundation to be intentional about sort of looking at the disbelonging that has happened and it, among communities of color and figure out what to do. And finally, the, the thing that I wanna talk a little bit about more is our cultural strategists in government. Uh, we um, did, in the first round we did, uh, how many did we, I had, I had, I worked with five departments human services department, the mayor's office of housing and security, planning and building, transportation, the department of rest and equities. So they, these were fellowships in which the artists were our cultural workers or community members, uh, activists would come in and work with the departments to do policy shifts, narrative shifts related to um, imagining uh, something else. And let me read a short little description. Roberto, you have one minute remaining. Oh my God, I wouldn't, then I'm not gonna read that. Uh, they were just, they were wonderful. They were really about doing the kind of shift that we would try to imagine that government, uh, how do you build trust? And, but I will end with this quote, which has nothing to do with the cultural strategists, but uh, has to do with poetry. Um, there's a poet I love. Uh, he's been gone for a while named Robin Blazer. He was Canadian. Uh, and he, he's in the Canadian context, he you know, was part of cultural policy making. So he said, cultural conditions always approach what we mean by the word world or the process of posing one. The world is never separately by simplicity strict, social, political, artistic, or sacred, but rather it is made up of the entanglements of discourses having to do with men, women, earth, and heaven. And what I love about this is the work of composing the world. And how do, how do you do it in City Hall? I try. Incredible, thank you so much. Um, we, so one quick announcement before we go to our last person. Uh, we learned that we were not able or we didn't successfully raise the limit for the number of people joining um, our Zoom. So apologies for people who couldn't get on, but just know that there's another hundred or so watching this live. So hello and um, thank you for joining with us. Now we're going to go to um, Masu Moitra. Um, Masoom is with Greenlight District. Masoom, we're so excited to hear what you have to say. I know that you have been doing a lot of work really around self-determination um, and values, um, powerful values like that, uh, that come out of your cultural work. Thank you, Amalia. And thanks for reminding us how many more people are watching. We already have this amazing room of people. And I'm going after an incredible lineup <laughs> of panelists, so no pressure at all, right? Uh, but thank you, everyone who's spoken so far. It's such an honor to build on whatever you said, and I will be building on that. Um, so as Amalia introduced me, I'm, my name is Masu Moitra. Um, I'm the director of El Puente's Greenlight District. I'm a community urban planner and an artist. Um, I also teach part-time at Parsons. Um, the way I came to know NOCDNY and work uh, together and with Gonzalo and with many others on this call is through um, New York's um, uh, cultural plan. And that's how we uh, got to working together and we continued after that on many projects. Um, and I'm glad we have these peer exchanges to um, keep those conversations going and keep organizing together. Um, so I wanted to talk to uh, a little bit today about the liberatory, the liberatory potential and concept of flipping the narrative uh, and why this is so important for cultural movements and institutions 
especially those representing historically marginalized peoples and communities. Um, and I think the best way to talk about it is really by rooting it into a deep understanding of the green light district, which um, illustrates this concept um, and has been for uh, a long time. The green light district um, is an initiative of El Puente, which itself is a community human rights organization for those who aren't familiar um, that has been around for almost 40 years now. Um, and the Green Light District itself was started around 10 years back uh, by Luis Garden Acosta, who was also uh, the founder and leader of El Puente. Um, and it was started as a holistic community development initiative and self-determination. Um, so just to give you a little context about the background in which the Green Light District came up, um, it came up in a, in a very, very uh, rapidly gentrifying Williamsburg in Bushwick. It was at the peak of gentrification at that time. Uh, and what El Puente leaders refer to as the cultural genocide, uh, which is still ongoing. And even though many people think that these poverty corridors do not exist in Williamsburg and Bushwick, they very much do. Um, and uh, on top of everything else, they're also environmental justice communities. So in Luis's words, uh, the narrative that was imposed on this disappearing community at that time, 10 years back, was very much that of helplessness and paralysis, as though that this massive tide of gentrification, this naturally occurring tide, um, had the capacity to wipe everything out on its way, and everyone on its path had to just helplessly accept um, what this tide um, had to offer. Uh, and, and that tide was so powerful that there was nothing to do but to get swept away by it. Now, the GLD did not accept that, and El Puente did not accept that um, for its community. And the Green Light District was initiated with the hope of flipping and countering this narrative with one that is actually about um, bringing community members and leaders together to put powerful forces within the community together and to celebrate and preserve the existing culture, to recognize uh, what actually existed, um, and to say that we are still here and we are going to continue staying here. Um, and along with that, the second part was to actually study and connect this cultural preservation and cultural organizing efforts. El Puente was on the cultural organizing scene a very long back, a long time back, and to connect that to citizen science projects, which actually help you. Um, understand the issue um, to the core through community-led and youth-led um, efforts. And the third part was to actually develop um, a collective and uh, produce collectively a set of solutions and platforms and plans um, upon which the community can stand um, and tackle these issues. So together, really, this formed the narrative of self-determination. Um, but something I want to talk about is that the the idea of self-determination as we study in the classroom and as I have taught in the classroom myself is uh, of course very different from the, the messiness and of self-determination on the ground. Um, and I have come to learn many different things about it from our leaders. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, and the fact that self-determination is not a black and white concept. It is a very great concept. And in fact, it's not even an end goal but it's a you know it's a very long messy journey a process uh, that needs to be uh, that needs to unfold and that you need to dabble through over decades um, not a not a, a short term a project as claudie had mentioned before um, so one of the things uh, i've found is that self determination as inspiring and idealistic as a concept it is uh, on the ground it involves negotiating around uh, principles you know there's a lot of um, uh, there's a, there are a lot of times where you're negotiating and really uh, going back and forth around what uh, what the community principles are, what you're rooted in as community, and what to give up and what to stand with as you go along. And which is why it's very rooted, as what uh, Rashid said, is in to be rooted in history and legacy, uh, and to be uh, rooted in the movement world. And which is why I think El Puente's legacy of coming from the young lords, of coming from the young Christian workers movement is what really forms that foundation upon which a self-determination movement as a nonprofit can now be built. But without awesome. that, it's very challenging. 
Masum, there's uh, one minute remaining. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Emily. So, uh, and then uh, I would go into the holistic nature of self-determination. So it's not enough as a community. And this is, you know, every community uh, that has self-determination at its core is very aware of this. It's not enough uh, to just understand community needs, but connect it to community needs uh, that actually uh, give a very holistic approach to the process of problem solving. So it's not about just wanting green spaces, but connecting that to health equity, connecting that to affordable housing. And often at El Puente that has happened by connecting it through the arts and through cultural organizing, um, which makes this uh, process a very long and slow process with, without um, very quick and uh, very um, instant results, which of course is not conducive to how the nonprofit industrial complex works. So to, to understand that the infrastructure uh, and the ecosystem that's built around uh, movements that have become institutions like El Puente um, is, are still rooted in decolonial values and still demand a narrative that isn't liberatory and actually um, sometimes, um, you know, uh, provides a barrier to, to liberation in many ways. So it's important to recognize that and to recognize that tying that to capital, uh, uh, cap like financial capital, uh, makes it very problematic, and and of course we know that a lot of this, lot of this, you know, this industrial complex, as I call it, is uh, definitely also using the buzzwords of equity and self determination, um, and that needs to, um, you know, there needs to be some accountability around that. Um, and then I want to go to the fact that collective self determination um, is also tied to self liberation, and at El Puente we do it through tying it to the work of the Global Justice Institute, which works with individuals to actually develop the uh, connection to legacy and principles, which are very important in continuing it uh, over the long term. And finally, I think self-determination is also um, very much about, uh, as an organization, if you're talking about self-determination, it's about representing a community voice. And there isn't one voice, there's so many voices and it's, there is no participatory planning tool. And I'm saying that as a participatory planner or no survey or no activities that we can do that can actually tap into those voices. And the only way that I have seen it being successfully done um, and that has been reflected in the Greenlight District is to make sure that it is the community members that are the leaders in the movement. It is people who started as young members at 16 who are now the directors and the you know the most senior people in the organization and the movement? It is uh, programs that are like after school programs, food distribution programs, where people really directly tap into the needs of community members, and those are reflected in the platforms that come out. So I'll stop here, and I know we are going to discuss a lot more about it. But yeah, thank you so much for um, being here. Thank you so much, Masoom. Um, so I'm going to invite everyone to take just sort of a, um, a mid break and come off of mute if you're on mute that's anyone panelists and presenters, and let's just have a moment of thanks clapping appreciation thank yous for everything that was just shared so come off mute and let's let's just do a quick little public thank you. Thank you. Excellent. 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 It's so um it was such rich information. I, I'm sure like me, you guys have been jotting notes furiously. There's a lot to process. And so before we break you into small groups, we just want to take a collective moment to, to take a breath and give you kind of one minute to write quietly to yourself. Um, any notes that you want to take, any thoughts that you have that you want to bring into your group. So that could be a clarifying question, a powerful observation, a shared learning, but just kind of one minute for some personal writing to reflect on what was an incredible half an hour of, of information and story. So I'll set the timer and then um, after the minutes up, we'll move people into small groups.
about 10 seconds left. All right, that's time. Um, so in a second, I'm going to invite Emily to give you more kind of technical explanations of um, how much time we're going to be in the room, um, any notices that you get. But for right now, I'll say this. This is really the beginning of kind of the peer exchange portion of the day. And so we're going to break you into small groups. These are self-guided conversations. You're not going to get any chat messages about what you should be discussing. What we hope is that you sort of look at your personal writing, you reflect on what you heard, and you have a rich conversation where everyone in your small group has an opportunity to share something. Um, you'll be in small groups for about 15 minutes. Um, and Emily, I'll invite you now to step in and say how big the groups are going to be and what kind of notices they'll get on time. Sure. Hi, this is Emily on speaking. Um, we're going to have uh, small groups for 15 minutes and each group will have four to five uh, participants and there will be announcements um, with five minutes remaining and then two minutes remaining. All right, so and we'll actually, see you on the other side. I'm going to jump in here and I just want to invite the people in the live stream that they can join the Zoom now. We have space and if they want to participate in the small groups they should come join us on the Zoom. Great. All right, so rooms will be opening shortly. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Hi there. I don't see a. I don't see any invitation for a room. Okay, so I'm gonna move. Um, Me neither. Me as well. I'm gonna mo move folks now because I think uh, when I set up the breakout rooms, you were maybe not here yet. Okay, just give me a moment, please. Thank you, Emily. Sure. Hi, did you? I, no one was talking group? in my group. It okay. was the yes, same thing with me. <laughs> okay, I can move you all. Um, let me figure out where you are right now. Do you remember which room you might have been in? I was in room 11. Okay, great. I was in maybe seven, but I don't remember. Okay, Karen, I'm going to move you into a different room. Okay. And then 
And Steffi, I will move you into a different room as well. Thank you. Hi, Pablo. Hi, uh, I'm trying to, I'm not sure, is this a breakout room or? This is not, Do you, um, did you make it into a breakout room yet? I did, but then everyone left. <laughs> so okay. I, I was assuming that like they were switching I see, the room I see you, you, I will move you into a different room. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Jason. Hi, Kim. Hi, who are you? Sorry, I'm late. Oh, um, <laughs> I am Emily. Hi, I am. Um, we're in small breakout rooms. Would you like to be put in one for the last five minutes? Sure. What are they doing in the breakout rooms? Um, it's just a really free flowing conversation kind of based off of what um, was shared so far by the panelists, but I'm sure you can just join and Okay. And Jason, would you like to be put in a different room? Jason, are you are you there?
Welcome back, everyone. I think I'm looking at the numbers. I think we have a few rooms that still have to close. Is that right, Emily? No. They're all closed? Yes. Okay, great. Well, welcome back, everyone. I just want to encourage everyone to take a breath. We have a lot of people with us in this space and watching online. And as we move into the sort of the question answer discussion part, I just want to ask everyone to have patience with each other. We're going to try to get to as many people and questions and voices as we can, but moving a lot of people in Zoom is always an interesting challenge. So we had an incredible um, conversation in our own breakout room. I was with some of the speakers and in a second, I'm going to share some of the themes that emerged. And as I share our themes that emerged, what we were talking about, um, I encourage all of you in chat to share any of your own reflections. So again, this could be a clarifying question. It could be a powerful observation that you had, a shared learning, um, but we'd like to get as many of those into the chat as we can. And then in a second, we'll actually look through them together to, to pull out some to talk about. Um, but as you're doing that work, I'll just give a little recap of our conversation and invite any of the panelists um, to riff on some of these themes. You know, I think they can be characterized in some ways as sort of the tensions, the questions, and the, and the creative antagonism that emerges when you begin to talk about st stories, um, narrative, meaning making, um, culture. And so we talked about, you know, the, the interesting and challenging relationship between violence and narrative right now, and also how it's linked to new kinds of work and reimaginations. We talked about um, culture and the contested battleground um, of, of the, in, the, in the cultural back, um, battleground. We talked about history as the present, present and the past all at the same time and how that feeds into the work that people are doing. We also talked about the challenge of time, right? Time as a time, somewhat as a construct, but time also as a, as a barrier and a motivator for when you're doing long-term work um, with short-term funding or a short-term um, framework. And then we talked about the through line really being equity, right? That no matter the actions um, or the questions or the work people were doing, that the through line was really around surfacing and centering or recentering um, equity and community through all of that. So I'll open it up to the panel if any of you want to step in and reflect on any of that, and then um, encourage others to also look through the chat and see if there's some questions that emerge that we can particularly pull forward. So um, Rashid, um, Masoom, um, Nayantara, Claudie, any of you want to share a little bit about what we were talking about while I, while I pull some questions? I'll start off. Um, thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, I got all hot and bothered at the end and I was babbling and then everything went blank. So let me continue a little bit with my my babble in the context. I thought the convers our, our, we talked about violence and I thought it was very, very um, stimulating. And then I, we ended up talking, or I brought up the issue of trauma and that often in the discourse around trauma, it's about the individual that needs to kind of move through the trauma and the discourse around civic trauma is not um, foreground that whether you live, whether you've been policed, whether you're been unemployed, that's a form of civic trauma. That the 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 resolution to that trauma needs to have to look at the social systems that created that that pain. So, thank you. And I know Nayantara, you wanted to jump in too. Sure, thanks um, everyone. I'll jump in. We talked about a range of things in our little breakout too, but just to add on to the piece that Roberto has shared here about violence and trauma, one of the things we talked about in the context of narrative and culture, because on, on the progressive and on the, the sort of the radical left, there is such a lack of narrative 
infrastructure and cultural infrastructure for power building. Um, we have strategies that essentially mimic what the right and the far right have done, which are strategies of extreme control, strategies of convergence, which is to say we take a narrative, we converge around it, and then we push it through in a messaging, in a messaging oriented way. And we actually don't have um, a lot of ways to consent to narrative and to culture. There's very few mechanisms that we have which say, we as a community, we choose self-determination. We have participatory processes that we choose this narrative. We choose this kind of transformation of culture, which is also related to what Masum was sharing about um, the complexity and the messiness of what self-determination in community context can look like. Um, so we did talk a bit about what that means when we have strategies for narrative convergence and enclosure as opposed to strategies for narrative abundance and consent and um, how we can get there without leaning on the mechanisms that um, we have seen work, but only because they've worked on the political right because they're issues and narratives that have been framed by the right and have won in the last several decades, essentially. Um, so wanted to bring that into the mix as well. Thank you. Um, just wanna pause and see if there's any questions in the chat from the audience. We wanna make sure uh, we capture those. And while we're waiting for any questions, um, Linda Paris Bailey, I'm going to invite you to come off mute and share a little bit about your conversation, especially around story circles, digital storytelling, etc. Okay, <laughs> one of the uh, participants in my group was asking about um, basically process in terms of uh, collecting stories and, and sharing stories. So um, we offered a, a, a few tools, which I've put in the chat and I believe uh, one other person has put in the chat so that um, you know people can do their own uh, research and, and gathering of tools. So that basically was uh, kind of central to the story. But also we uh, talked about um, what was happening with the curriculum in Virginia and how that curriculum is changing uh, or has changed and uh, what resources might be there. Um, I asked, you know, where that might be available, but uh, again, um, looking at uh, history or history as story, I would, I would kind of refer to it as that and, and re reclaiming the stories of, uh, of the African-American community in particular, and also looking at other uh, BIPOC communities in terms of the, the curriculum. So that was what I heard and gathered. Um, I didn't know I was going to be reporting or else I would No, it's notes. fine. Thank you um, for sharing. Yeah, I think, I think that I think uh, probably the other members of that group can can add more to that conversation. Great, thank you. Well, I see a couple more um, questions have come in on chat. We have one from Sinead Lopez. Um, how do you think about cultural organizing within the context of global capitalism? Big question, um, which often serves to alienate folks from community, culture, traditions, and even themselves. Um, and I will see if there's anyone on the panel who would like to take that. Um, I can uh, respond a little bit. Um, I also want to connect to this, what Linda just talked about, um, or uh, collecting stories, firstly, because I feel like um, that has something deeply to do with visibilizing. Um, for example, like uh, right now, they were working on a campaign called Nuestro Aire, Our Air. Um, and, you know, uh, the city at the same time is doing the citywide environmental adjusting mapping process. Um, and they, and because they were working at the census track data level, they completely eliminated long time environmental justice communities that are in gentrifying areas because they were looking at data in that way. And one of the only strategies we have in the face of that is to collect oral histories and stories of people who are going through this to in the face of, you know, this kind of, uh, um, uh, this other kind of level scale of data and citywide processes that are not looking at um, hyper-local stories that might not go with the uh, trend of uh, data. So I just wanted to 
uh, acknowledge Linda's point. In terms of capitalism, I feel like um, I, I feel that's another reason that we are we focus so much on um, you know um, on on radical activism through the arts at El Puente. That wasn't um, necessarily where El Puente came from. It came from a context, that, as I was telling Rashid and the others, of gun violence and public health equity and kind of having to develop counter narratives in uh, not not out of choice but out of compulsion in that context and um and very much and Edwante also works in Puerto Rico um around uh, climate justice issues which is very much all about capitalism you know about how you know venture capitalists have destroyed um the environment and you know public health resources education resources there um and about how that connects back to the diaspora here so it's also very much been about connecting the stories of how capitalism, global capitalism, has had its impact in Puerto Rico, and can, and knowing that the, the community in New York is very much tied to that community. They're not just Puerto Rico, but all the islands, uh, including DR and um, everyone else who uh, is located in communities there. So I feel like there's a deep and 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 of course like all the issue because as Rashid was saying that violence isn't just about gun violence or this it's also about policing it's also about not being able to breathe clean air because entire like COVID what COVID did you know entire communities were uh, had lower lifespans because of being located next to a certain kind of transit infrastructure next to a certain kind of industrial infrastructure and that's because development purely happened on the basis of profit on the basis of government also working at the service of um, real estate, even while doing zoning policy, while doing any of these policies. So I feel like uh, one of the uh, big, uh, you know, strategies against that has in fact been this flipping the narrative kind of strategy. So, and, you know, so I feel like it's everything to do with ultimately um, countering this uh, toxic, you know, intersection of capitalism, racism, patriarchy, that we are playing in right now, but I do want to hear from everyone else about that as well. That's beautiful. Does anyone else on the panel want to speak to that? Otherwise, I'll, I'll move to the next question. I wanted to um, just uh, back to Linda's point again, um, what, what uh, you just shared on the story circles. I'm really being, re I'm resonating around how it's, it's a tool of history and collection as well. And I just wanted to chime in that um, something we did, and Amalia, you could attest to this because you actually led this, is something we do uh, when we first introduced the story circle methodology of Junebug to the residents is educating them around how it's part of this lineage um, and that the Junebug process itself, I've seen in the chat, is being facilitated all over the United States alone. And so for participants of this process to really get that um, understanding that it is, um, you know, very personal and, and um, intimate in that space that they're in, but how it is also connected to a lineage of stories of themes and narratives shared across Black families across America, for example. And so I just wanted to attest to that and thank you for sharing that, Linda, from your team discussion. This is Richard. I just wanted to add a small point about capitalism and violence that, um, there's something that we talk about called slow violence. That is that, that for example, uh, targeting communities of color for hazardous waste is something that occurs on a regular basis and is killing thousands and thousands of people, but is not really seen uh, in being related to capitalism. It's a form of structural violence. Uh, it's, a, it's slow, but it's social murder. And we don't use terms like that, but we should. These are things that affect what we could call the social immune system of and the society affecting certain groups. So I think this is something that's been um, discussed in relation to the difficulties of representation of violence that takes place over a long period of time where people are dying, but it's not seen. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. I'm looking at the chat and um, Nayantara, we have a specific question for you. Um, which I'm sure many people will want to know about, which are frameworks, tools, and resources, which ones are out there. 
um, for our participatory consent based narrative abundance as you were sharing work like which one which tools have you come across that you can share yeah thanks for the question and i will um certainly drop a few things in the shared resources later but there's four um specific ideas or tools or just things that might be of use here. So one thing that, um, and I think actually Lisa and Claudie both um, referred to this already, that the, the strategy of harvesting data from a story circle and then linking it to narratives and then linking it to deep narratives, or sometimes they're called mental models or you know meta narratives, however you wanna call it, but the narrative at, that lives at the, um, the deeper level Right. The reason that works so well is because one single unit of a story instantly rings true. It, even if it's not factually true, when you hear a story, especially if you're immersed in it in the context of a story circle, and then you actually use the story circle process to part in a participatory way, harvest linkages link up those stories, generate themes and patterns. It rings true for the part the community that's participating because stories are embodied, stories are immersive, and they come from people's experiential realities. So in a way that you might encounter a story that is immersive, um, people will experience it as true, even if it is fiction, right? That's why disinformation works so well on the internet in a way, even, um, even in this particular era where it's, it's like has its own currency. Um, so that's definitely one strategy to use. Um, the other couple of things I would um, share is that, and I'll drop this in the resources link, um, at Race Forward when I was working on the Narrative and Cultural Strategies program there, we would use a tool called the Narrative Pyramid, which is quite intuitive. It's the, imagine a pyramid, um, like a triangle, at the bottom of the, the triangle are stories, up one level are narratives, um, sorry, forgive me, the bottom of the triangle are messages, up one level are stories, up one level are narratives, and then at the very, very bottom of um, the iceberg or the tip of the triangle is deep narratives. So sometimes people have a range of different narratives that are operating at the same time, but the deep narrative, which is the fundamental value that you might align around is actually aligned and, and shared with a community. So the community might actually believe we want safety and we want health and wellness for all our people in our community from young to old, right? But they might disagree about which narratives actually get them there. So the, the question of abundance is, is actually that we don't need alignment at every level. We need alignment on values and principles, and we need multiple narratives in an ecosystem that, um, that proliferate those values and systems. So our stories don't have to match. And in fact, they won't because people's experiences are so different. Our narratives don't have to match, but our deep narratives and our value systems do. And they have to be interpreted in the same way across the community so that people can move in concerted action. This part feels important to me to say, because I will say as a cultural strategist, I struggle with when questions and conversations come up about, do we have values alignment? Because at a surface level, people will say that their values aligned. You know, If you talk to someone who is a lobbyist for the NRA, they will interpret the value of safety the same way, not the same way, but in a different way, they'll also say safety is important, right? But it might actually mean something completely different in the context of those of us who are trying to advocate for community safety and protection for youth of color or trans folks of color um, in communities that are actually being affected by gun violence. So that piece feels important. And the two other things I'd like to share that I will also drop in the, um, the resource document, um, sometimes narrative abundance or narrative convergence, it feels like narratives are in conflict with each other because there's a question of timeline. Like what is a short-term timeline versus a long-term timeline? One way this has come up recently for me and some immigration work I've been doing through a program called the Butterfly Lab for Immigrant Narrative Strategy. Um, whether or not a narrative about immigrants are essential in the short term, links up with a narrative of whether borders are even natural or not. Should we even have borders? Should the nation state even be an organizing principle for us, right? So I don't know, maybe it's really a question of a hundred year vision or a 200 year vision versus a five year policy uh, window, right? So sometimes timeline is an issue. And then one other framework that might be of use here is there is a framework, I think it's called the 4R framework, which is how do you orient to change 
or to making change? Are you trying to reform? Are you trying to recreate? Are you trying to resist? Are you trying to reimagine? Those strategies look different based on where you sit in a change ecosystem. So the narratives look different um, when, you're, when you're actually applying them to strategy as well. And those can be good ways to explore abundance together. We don't all need to align around the same narrative to get to the vision of the future that we want. We just need to actually envision the future and move towards it together. And there's many paths to get there. So um, that's what comes to mind. Thanks, Amalia. Yes, thank you. Um, Karen, I see you had a question. Do you want to ask it? Uh, <laughs> now I have to find it. Um, basically, what I was asking is we're in a moment in New York, we're about to have a major leadership shift in conventional politics. And we're also talking about what is this, what does it mean to reimagine New York as it as with a truly just recovery. And all of that discussion is bombarding us. But what would it, how can story and narrative actually make it possible for people and communities to be fully engaged in this conversation? What does civic engagement look like that is truly inclusive because people feel like they're part of the story and they're shifting, they're part of making the narrative? Who wants to take that? Well, I, I was just gonna, I wanted to kind of connect this back to the, the conversation around global capitalism just a little bit. And I wanted to first share that um, Roberto and, and Richard, I think both of your points kind of emerged in terms of the, the slow violence that Richard was speaking to, but then this idea of like the trauma that we're experiencing or that communities experience that we may not call it for what it is because we're so often because of responsibility, because of the frameworks in which, you know, as Americans, we're taught to individualism, um, this idea that collective harm that happens because of state violence or violence, as we don't use it in that language was kind of what we we're discussing in our group. But to, to Karen's question, to the point that I think we've been raising overall, I think that the tension for artists, and, and I'm just thinking about myself, and I think about cultural workers in general and organizers, is this constant tension between um, how do we immerse people into a larger narrative infrastructure, but understanding that narrative infrastructure and the power in which we're, we're building within is within a capital structure, meaning that we have to rely on resources, we have to rely on money, we have to ensure that our ideas become popular to some degree, which now within the social media landscape means that those ideas have to go viral or they have to go to reach a larger audiences in order to get more money. And that more money means more power, quote unquote, or uh, more people translate to more money. And so we're now in a dynamic that I think we wrestle oftentimes similar to past artists and, and cultural workers as how much, you know, how do we stay authentic? How do we stay true within trying to continue to build um, a world that has a vision that is still equitable, but also striving and understanding that, you know, you know, if we all believe that artists should be, you know, paid well, that artists should be treated as other workers, just like teachers should be treated as other workers, just like everyone else should, as, as we've learned throughout the pandemic that quote unquote essential workers, that we all are to some degree, but there are others who are doing work that are often not seen and imagined. I think global capitalism kind of masks oftentimes the reality that um, artists are essential. So to the, to the point, I really think that, uh, and I think people are doing this, I know some foundations are doing this. I'm hoping that we can all come together and create like a, a cultural um, request or ask, because when I see Naratara made this point earlier, when we see the conversation around the infrastructure bill, I'm hoping that that $3 trillion, that large part of it becomes a WPA type of model for artists. And I think we need to see that not just as a national effort and that's something we can all rally around, but oftentimes I think that's something that we could, we definitely should do in New York City specifically. But if we're talking beyond New York City and we're talking about other regions of cities, we know that culture and the arts at the heart of how we transmit and also sustain ourselves through the pandemic in terms of staying sane, but also ensuring that those people get back to work and have the foundation upon which they work. And so I think global capitalism to me in that tying back is that money still matters. And I know that that's not 
a lot of our value system in terms of how we think about progressiveness. But if we're talking about living wages, people having a roof over their head, people having food, and artists often being seen as, you know, the starving artists and being last on that list. I think that right now is a prime opportunity with all these stimulus bills and resources that we mobilize some effort to engage in conversations about how communities should be, you know, infused with greater um, infrastructure and resources to support artists. And I think that's the opportunity that presents itself at this moment for us. Is that easy? No, but I think there's a historical reference point, as I've said, around the WPA and other models, which if you look at it, and you think about June Bug, you think about story circles, you think about the ways in which we capture narratives, individuals, and community. There's a one model that way. And then there's also the model of um, engaging artists themselves to tell their stories and documenting those things in a way and giving them resources. So that's one model that comes to mind for me. Thank you. We have about four minutes left. So I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to share. So Claudie and Roberto, I want to invite you in with any last words on any of the questions that have come up um, recently or reflections from um, our breakout. I was just honored to listen to my brilliant colleagues. I feel like I got more homework. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And I would just say, you know, longevity, 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 <laughs> sustainability, and this work is not um, accomplished in a day. And to keep that commitment and, and inspiration um, to understand that this work is long-term. Excellent. Well, we have maybe one more minute left. So Nayantara, let's see, Masoom, um, Rashid, anyone else, just one last sentence in closing. Um, I just want to say that it's so good to work with peers to work through contradictions because I've been struggling with what, like what each of you have brought up and what Rashid just brought up about, you know, also like, the exploitation of artists, but also the state supported artists or foundation supported artists. How does that uh, work in a movement world in, in like, and, and what, what is that tension between the two, between visibilizing and being able to compensate artists without neutralizing their power <laughs> here now. So I feel like these are contradictions to work through in a peer group. And this is so incredible to be a part of. Great. I think to add just gratitude. Thank you all. Beautiful conversation. It was such a great conversation. So I'm going to invite everyone off Zoom one more time to turn off your mute, come back on. Just one more collective round of applause for everyone on the panel, but also yourselves for participating in this night and sharing. So thank you so much, everyone. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Great. We're getting some cheers. Thank you. Yay. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Karen, I'm gonna turn it over to you to close. I really enjoyed being with all you, um, everyone tonight. Thank you, thank you again. And Karen, it's all yours. And extra claps for Amalia. Yay, Amalia. Hearing the ship and for Emily, yes. Tom Levy and Tom Asau for doing the amazing work to make the Zoom actually happen. And, um, Thank you. When we were putting this together, we were starting, we were imagining what the dream team would look like to have this conversation. And you all said yes. And we've been looking forward to it so much. And it's been even better than we expected. So thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. Um, I'm going to give some funding credits, which are really important for us. The New York Department, City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the New York City Council and our commissioner, Gonzalo Casals, joined us today. Um, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and we have colleagues from there. I know Steffi and Corinna and, I'm, and Richard and others joined us from that department. And um, we also had the National Endowment for the Arts. And thank you. We've had representatives from the NEA with us as well today. So thank you so much for joining us. We also want to acknowledge Kate DiCecchio, whose artwork was on our invitation and was so fantastic. And she joined us today as well. 
So please remember to put your resources in the Google Doc. We wanna be able to share them back to everybody and look out for an email. You'll get the recording from this session so you can share it with others. We'd love you to do that. And uh, we'll put links in there for some of our resources. So thank you again for joining us. And thank you to the NYU students, um, my class, which is here. And I'm gonna ask you all to stay on when everybody leaves. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. See you later. <laughs> Karen, would, would there be a group discussion?